<laughs> now, uh, that was the, so those were our two speakers. I'd like to thank both of them again for uh, taking the effort to prepare uh, comments for this meeting. Um, we do have some additional time and really do want to use this opportunity when we're all uh, together to uh, make sure that we're hearing from all of you about any uh, uh, suggestions, issues, concerns. So um, let me ask if there's anybody else um, participating in the meeting who would like to raise uh, any other uh, questions or uh, uh, issues. Shy group. <laughs> All right, well, um, <laughs> sorry, Ellen's uh, pushing people forward in the audience. Oh. But, uh, to uh, this, yeah, this isn't, um, you know, eighth grade. We're not going to call on in the class. If this has really been helpful to have you get a little better idea of what Reagan Udall is supposed to be doing, because it is sometimes difficult to articulate to folks what, what it is we're working on. So any feedback about that as well would be helpful. Other ways that we can better communicate um, would be useful as well. well. I do see some heads nodding, and, and I think, again, my expectation is in addition to making this a, a, a regular occurrence and one that as more projects uh, uh, become, uh, get under consideration and get into uh, uh, implementation, we're going to have uh, even more to talk about in future meetings. Um, but in addition, uh, we're looking for comments, and we don't need them right this, this minute, but uh, um, any comments you have on how to promote uh, 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 useful interaction around uh, new project ideas and around uh, further implementation of activities that we have underway. Uh, hopefully at this point, um, people have a, a better understanding of the, the major, uh, the three major pillars of our um, uh, initial foundation activities and some of the initial projects that are underway and in process in each of those areas and so we uh, welcome uh, further comments and collaboration. I, I appreciate the spirit of uh, both of the comments we received in terms of uh, further interaction with the foundation. Um, the, uh, uh, the, there are, as I said, some uh, uh, existing opportunities for that input including uh, through our website uh, and uh, uh, I guess, Jane, we expect to have a, a listserv up and running mm -hmm. soon for right. uh, updates whenever we do have a, a press release or a project announcement or, or things like right. that. We have, expect to have that up and running soon so you can get uh, automatically uh, uh, notified. Yeah, within the next week we should have the listserv up. So if you go back to the website, you'll be able to sign up and we'll, we won't send you too many emails, but just a, a few as we uh, have announcements. I should, we should also say that it is the Food and Drug Administration and we are looking at food projects as well, yes. so we, so, so, yes. th that is important. We are not just looking at drugs and devices, we're looking at the entire spectrum of, of, of projects and there are a few food things that are filtering up that we will be looking at. So we, in fact, we hope to have a food project up in probably the next year as well. And we're having discussions with the um, USDA and some collaborative ideas around some food projects. So more coming on that too, as there are a yes. lot of scientific <laughs> opportunities there as well. Um, let me ask if there are any other comments from uh, board members. Um, yeah, I, I would just uh, say that you know I know it's hard to come and just listen, and but I just wanted to encourage people if you even if you have questions, um, you know, mm -hmm. to ask them because we're, that's why we're here. And uh, not just here today, but if things, right. if others occur to you as you hear more about what we're doing or have some further ideas on how we can collaborate, please do uh, send them in to us. Mark, can I just add? Yeah, go ahead, um, can we move? I would hope that the advocacy groups, when they communicate and write articles for their own newsletters, that they would also encourage people to submit ideas. And um, you know you could do them by aggregating them, which is helpful, or just having sent in through the website. But I think to encourage to to further spread the word that the more people who know about this, the more ideas will have come forward. That's right. It's really important for for sort of the broadest range of uh, filtering for ideas as we can, but also for building up these coalitions, uh, communication 
and partnerships are absolutely critical, absolutely critical to everything that we're doing. You heard that in every one of the projects that Jane was describing. And um, at a you know, minimum now with a, a, a up and running website and some, some background resources on the website along the lines that Jane just went through today, certainly would um, be very much appreciative if you could provide links to those. Uh, but as, uh, uh, as uh, Helen said, uh, a more active effort uh, on the part of your groups for questions that involve you know, regulatory development science uh, where this kind of collaboration could be helpful and you think we might have a foundation for the start of a partnership, we'd very much like to hear about those specific ideas too. I think also um, I would add into that that we're also looking for innovative ways to collaborate. Um, there are some interesting ideas as I've been scouting around about new and different ways to collaborate and so yeah I guess the good news about us being you know in the startup mode is that we're open to all sorts of things. So. Uh, and particularly looking for innovative ways to collaborate on scientific projects. So I'd be interested in those ideas as well. Uh, do, you, do you mind uh, going to the microphone yourself, and, and let us know who you are? Right? Uh, hi, I'm David Parvier, a uh, filmmaker. Um, my question is, what are you guys actively doing to raise money in the public and private sectors? Um, we are at sort of, I think this, this is the kind of effort that we're undertaking that will have a bearing on the, the funds that we raise. Uh, as you heard about from Jane's presentation, um, our focus is on what are the right projects and a, a process for vetting those and building those partnerships. And part of that is uh, determining whether we can find the right funding for those projects. Uh, as, uh, uh, I expect that our funding will continue or will, will be sort of part of this um, uh, core support for our staff from FDA appropriations and then part from uh, a mixture of nonprofit uh, organizations, advocacy uh, organizations, scientific groups, uh, industry support, uh, things like that. And uh, all of that's going to be subject to our disclosure policies and, and project by project review through the, the board. Uh, guided by those policies. Yeah, yeah, I think it's hard generally to get contributions, general public contributions, yes. um, for general operations, although we would be happy to accept them. <laughs> but uh, I think as we start to get into the specifics of projects and as they uh, impact patient groups or individuals or foundations uh, or others, then we think it will be a lot easier. We hope to get a mixture of um, corporate, um, individual, uh, foundation, nonprofit support, so we have, uh, and, uh, um, and appropriations. You know, the appropriations, though, theoretically will cover our operations, but as we start to do projects, there will be a percent, we will not be able to just exist just on the appropriation. We will have a percentage of the projects we take, similar to the FNIH, depending on the project. So, and there, I think it will be a lot easier. So really, it's, it's project specific at this point for fundraising, or at least most of our efforts. Um, once we figure out what it is we're working on, then we try to think about who would be interested in helping fund that particular project or participate in some other way. So, yeah, you have some idea in mind. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Well, we well, have an idea. We should happy them. Happy. I mean, I, I'm particularly interested in, in the uh, IMEDS project, mm -hmm. and um, where do you anticipate funding for that will come from? I think that project is still in development, but I expect um, several sources. Um, a number of foundations are very interested in supporting um, the, the, the regulatory science and capacity building. So those fellowship programs that, uh, that Jane was describing, I think a, a lot of uh, uh, nonprofit groups would, uh, I think there's kind of a general consensus, and maybe some of our academic mem members, Bill, you may want to comment on this too, that um, we don't have uh, training programs in place for people who are, um, who can be at the cutting edge of using these very large databases and, and systems for identifying potential safety problems and the like much more quickly than we've done in the past. So there's a lot of interest there. Um, some, uh, this is obviously of uh, a core concern for the FDA, so some FDA appropriations have already been used for um, some initial uh, project activity in these areas too and obviously a lot of interest from the private sector and that's something that we'll be continuing to pursue as the, the projects get off the ground. I, I can make a few comments, Mark. First of all, the, the need for a, 
private-public partnership uh, is never greater uh, to tackle the problems that we all face, which is to produce uh, uh, better, safer uh, medicines and therapies for all of our patients, uh, uh, sometimes including ourselves. And, and so it, it becomes very, very personal. And when we hear the stories of uh, therapies that um, take too much time, you know, cost too much to come out, we're all invested in making um, changes that, that will improve this. Uh, in terms of the, the, the focus on uh, some issues relative to regulatory science um, as opposed to the policies, uh, this is an area that the FDA, the NIH, all of us are very interested in. The problem is that we don't know quite what it is. Um, and I think that doesn't and shouldn't prevent us from tackling the problem. Uh, the basis for the decisions that we all need to make uh, relative to, to efficacy and safety um, are, are certainly there. We have an opportunity. I think in science there's an inflection point uh, that we're approaching where the kinds of uh, data that we get, the kinds of approaches that we might take are potentially allowing us to, to be able to define better tests and better decisions that we can make based on those, those tests. Part of this is research. And, and of course, the FDA can't do this, industry can't do this in a sense. And so we need to do it, and academia can't do it. So it's a matter of, and foundations can't either. So we must all come together on the research. In terms of the uh, fellowship, the training part, this is exceedingly important because if we don't begin to uh, educate folks, now you can say, you can ask the question, if we really don't know what the field is, how do you educate? But we have to begin to uh, introduce some of our best and smartest people uh, in, in this country, in this world, to the problem itself, then we're never going to get there. And I think that's one of the goals of, of the foundation as, as, as well. And then finally, in terms of the third pillar in terms of communications, that's also exceedingly important because I think there's still some questions on misunderstanding of what the foundation is supposed to do. Uh, and, and as you can hear and hopefully understand now, that it really is a group that is an independent group that can actually begin to address these problems. First small steps, but, but hopefully can take big steps in the future. I, I'd like to add a few things on, on to the topic and about IMED specifically. I think that when we look at medical product development, and actually somewhat in foods and nutrition, we keep going back in our paradigm to the basics. We keep going back to the cells, we keep going back to the animals, and we keep trying to build out from that research. One of the things I think that we're not capitalizing on is what I call, or what one would call, is reverse engineering, and that is using the information we have in hand about what's actually happening, both in those pre-market studies and in the post-market setting, to have an understanding about how do people stratify in terms of real-world responses to therapies and real world practice medicine. And we really, really need to get a better handle on that. So that information I think is critical and I think part of what we've laid out in the regulatory science agenda is to use the information we have in hand combined with the biology knowledge, combined with what's coming out in sort of the more traditional academia, which is underpinnings of mechanism of disease, cells, genes, et cetera, to get a better handle on what, how we even define disease. There's a report that the IOM has issued on precision medicine, which talks a, a, a fair amount about this. How are we going to redefine the taxonomy of disease? We currently know that many of our diseases are heterogeneous. We currently know that there are many differences in response to therapy, and yet we aren't really cataloging that and capturing that information in a systematic way that allows us to do a better job, not only at point of care, but in designing those next generation drugs by incorporating that knowledge. So I think this IMEDS project is one of many that are critical in terms of leveraging the data and the information that is currently out there in smarter ways to help design better drugs, next generation drugs. I think the other important point is we also know we're awash in data and that these data sources are be going to become more publicly available. We also know there's a major movement afoot in patients reporting um, their experiences through sites like patients like me. So there's going to be information and misinformation out there. And this methods piece is critically important 
because there will be people that find things, this will find its way into the media, and we will have to have a systematic approach to responding to mm -hmm. things that are discovered by people who are out mining data. They are and they will, and that is going to increase. So we need to work in public-private partnerships with all of the people at the table to help define a systematic process for how we'll go through and decide, is this real or is this not real? And that's really critically important for us to ensure consumer and patient confidence in, in the products that are currently out on the market and that will continue to come out on the market. The, the other thing about public-private partnerships that's been kind of, kind of eye-opening for me when we were doing just the TOX project, which was a small pilot, we ended up with a group of about 50 people and I think we came up with 30 sets of data that no one person in the room actually knew existed. And so the idea of starting to pull all these databases together in, in as much as we can um, to look at this data and share things back and forth is really just amazing. It's huge. And so that is part of what we're trying to do as well is have people contribute what a lot of the work that they've already done, particularly in a pre-competitive space. So that's the other thing that I think we'll be able to take advantage of. Mark, Mark could I, if I could, I'd just like to add a comment. Um, yeah. The voice will travel. The voice will travel. So, you know, I don't think I need to really remind anybody in this room that resources are extraordinarily scarce right now and, and probably scarcer than they've ever been. Uh, we have a very daunting challenge in front of us. So that to the extent that we are going to be able to successfully compete for resources that we need to fulfill our mission, we are going to have to demonstrate that we're adding value to the healthcare innovation ecosystem. And how do you measure that? What, what do I mean by that? I think the way that we would think about keeping score in terms of value delivered is lives saved, lives extended, suffering relieved, so things which are really tangible to patients. And that's why I'm so gratified to see the patient advocacy community coming forward and engaging with us today because that voice is should be the strongest in the innovation ecosystem that we all represent but often is not so to the extent that we are going to be able to do that we have to plan our projects and think about those projects very carefully with respect to how we're going to be able to deliver that value back and i, I believe fda is thinking about it in the same way and certainly we we are uh, an industry as well as academia yeah, and, and what's become increasingly clear is it's just not even the resources, although it is the resources, it's the silos. I mean, we really have to work together. I mean, if we're going to solve these problems, we have to bring, you know, we have to have transparency. We have to be careful about conflict, but we're not going to solve these problems unless there's partnership, and that's extremely clear on all sectors. So it's resources, but it's really the, the ability for sectors to work together towards these really important problems for patients. And the goal is the patient. Okay. Yeah, no, I, okay, <laughs> thanks. Um, no, I just, I know that the Patient, Consumer, and Public Health Coalition uh, some of the members were hoping to be here, but they're instead uh, working on the, the FDA user fee uh, legislation, which we're very glad that they're there. Um, so I just I just wanted to mention that I, I know that there have been concerns um, in the consumer community um, regarding conflicts of interest with these public-private partnerships. It is challenging. I, I don't think anybody would minimize that. Uh, on our board, but um, you know, we're really uh, hoping that through transparency and working together in a public kind of way, that we can make sure that everyone feels comfortable with what's you know what uh, what the Reagan Udall Foundation is doing. Certainly, um, felt you know the fellowship program. I fellowship programs are ones I think everybody agrees are desperately needed, but there's still going to be issues of after the fellows are trained, where are they going to work? Are they going to work at FDA? Are they going to work for industry? Are we training people uh, to strengthen FDA or are we training people to strengthen industry? So we do have to deal with those kinds of issues. And um, for Sentinel Project also, you know, whenever you're looking at data sets and trying to figure out what's going on, and this is an early warning system, you want to make sure that, um, that all voices are heard and that we are protecting um, the safety of patients as well as, you know, expediting getting desperately needed uh, medical products on the market. A lot of balancing. Okay. Yeah. Pat, you could just say, 
<coughs> I think it's very important to focus on resources. But turn that. I, I, <laughs> we are not short of resources. There, there's a thirty billion dollars being spent by the NIH, and maybe double that being spent by the industry on science and disease. So the, the issues are. I, I don't think it's about resources. The, the issues. Uh, it, it is that on the one side there are the patients that have the need, uh, on the other side there's a science community that's trying to provide answers or solutions for the need. But there's not an integrator in between, and the integrator is a critical element. Uh, the FDA is, is a little bit hogtied in the sense that they have to be reactive with the applications that come in. This Reagan Udall Foundation allows them to become proactive in terms of areas of science they want to pursue and, and to be able to connect on the one side the science and all the money that's going into the science and product development uh, and the patients on the other side to sort of take the major issues that stand in the way and address them in a meaningful way, in an integrated partnership way. Uh, I think that's the promise of the foundation. That is why at the Gates Foundation, we reached out to RUF because there wasn't a way we could solve the problem any, through other channels. And, and, and RUF came about at about the right time because we knew on the one hand there are two billion people with TB, 1.4 million people dying each year from it, and industry actually developing products, but there was no way to get those products to a significant solution to address the problem. Uh, and, and I think that's the promise of Reagan Udall Foundation. If we don't have money for our projects, it's because we're not articulating that promise very well. And, and I, I think that's the challenge for the foundation, is to demonstrate what value we're providing, as Gary says, uh, with appropriate examples of success, and, and we're just starting to work towards that. Uh, and, and I believe that it's such a logical, rational, investment of money that it won't be hard for people with the money to contribute to it if, in fact, we can demonstrate results. Other, um, other comments, uh, questions? Thank you all for a, a great discussion. Yeah. Just had a comment? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so um, from where I sit with employers and employees, we see one of the biggest problems is that even when there is available available drugs that are safe and effective, people less than half the time actually continue to take the drugs. Now, it, obviously, if you have a devastating disease and you have a drug, they're much more likely to do that. But even then, there was a study recently published that something like um, not 100 percent of those who've had a heart attack and were prescribed a beta blocker stopped taking them with, if they even filled the prescription. So uh, one of the things that uh, I think what Vicki was talking about, understanding more about what happens, obviously some of that is people don't like the side effects or it doesn't seem to work. So, so getting to the understanding of why and when <laughs> drugs are not working or not being taken and having much more insight about that in order to be more tailored and the probability would probably would be much more likely to con continue to take the drug as prescribed. And that's a huge, I mean, talk about, that's a tens of billions of dollars of lost opportunity and quality of life. And that we, we need to pay attention to that as well. You know, uh, Corey is looking at some of these issues and adherence is one of the biggest issues. What's interesting is now we have the ability to partner with foundations like Reagan Udall, like the FDA, the NIH, CDC, to really look at these challenges. And this is, there is a lot of opportunity and in, in intersection between some of these efforts. And I think that adherence is a huge one. Other questions or comments? I have one more. <laughs> um, I'm making a documentary about Diana Levine, who um, she, uh, was awarded $7.4 million in uh, the Supreme Court case, Wyeth versus Levine. Um, she lost her arm after being injected through push IV of Finnegan. Um, I've spoken with uh, countless people across the United States. 
who still inject this drug through a push IV. Um, and there's a chance that through the IV push, uh, the drug can mix with arterial blood and cause gangrene in the limb. Um, you spoke, uh, Diana, about these early warning detection. Um, what are you guys planning on doing? Can you incorporate this um, IMED system with current issues that are going on with medicines that, um, you know, those who are administering drugs throughout this country um, could be warned about issues that are currently happening, or is it only an early detection program? But maybe uh, just to, uh, first of all, there, there are a lot of very important safety issues with medications. I mean, they all have benefits, but they all carry risk too. And I think as you heard from a lot of the comments here, uh, there is a sense that we're really at, uh, Bill called it was an inflection point, maybe a, a fundamentally new era in being able to learn much more precisely about uh, the associations between adverse events and maybe benefits of, of treatments and the particular kinds of patients and circumstances in which they are being used. Our goal of the foundation, I think, is to help support that science, that, that evidence coming together, which as you've heard takes real collaboration because you know the, the data from you know on paper in one doctor's office may not get connected to things that are going on elsewhere around the country and, and data from um, one insurance system or one healthcare organization may not get connected to patterns that, uh, that, that really are there but that we don't have either the, the systems in place or the research methods developed to, to detect them uh, quickly and reliably. That's the kind of thing that the foundation is, is working on. Um, I do want to make a distinction between that and the kind of things that the FDA works on, which is uh, given all of the available evidence, what's the right thing to do from a regulatory policy standpoint? And that's, uh, you know, I, I, having been there, I know how hard of a challenge that can be with uh, a lot of uh, uh, imperfect uh, evidence coming in and a lot of competing uh, issues and concerns to balance. And um, I have all the sympathy of the world for the FDA in, in dealing with those issues, but that's not the foundation's mission. So what we're going to try to do is develop the, the science, support the better evidence so that uh, not just the FDA, but, but frankly everyone, uh, the, the public, the uh, uh, health care providers, uh, others who are paying the bills, everyone can have better evidence to use uh, to make their decisions as a result of better science supporting the FDA's mission. I, I just want to add that since I brought it up that um, even though the Sentinel project is an early warning system, early warning <laughs> isn't that early necessarily. Um, and so uh, this is a project that was funded um, through the last FDA uh, user fee reauthorization and will be continued to be funded hopefully by the new bill. Um, it is something that FDA is already doing. And the goal is to look at existing data sets to see that patients who've had particular treatments, you know, what happens to them, which treatments mm -hmm. are working better, which ones are not working as well. I don't know anything about the specific um, treatment you're talking about, but ideally, certainly the, the Sentinel Project would <coughs> gather that kind of information, and our role would be to make sure that the science is there of how to interpret the findings. I think Diana has it right. We are not a regulatory body. We don't advise the FDA, but we support the science mission. So hopefully we can get uh, the methods and the science and the experts to help so we understand what's relevant and what isn't and to have larger and larger databases put their data in. But it is not our job to, right. to, to issue Sign. these more. And you don't want that. And we don't <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. good, good question. Um, any others? Yes, uh, come on up. So, uh, I I'm not please filmmaker. identify who you are. I'm not a filmmaker, but I do have a comment and, and a question. Uh, I'm Dave Vibraska with, uh, with Pfizer. Um, I, I think it, it's got to be said um, out of the gate, um, particularly for those of us who, who follow this sort of thing. Um, congratulations to you guys. Um, we appreciate that you've gone through a lot of political hurdles, um, logistical hurdles, funding hurdles, staffing hurdles. Uh, congratulations for, for getting us to, to here today. Um, and some of the work early on looks really great. Um, I do have a question, um, which relates to something, Mark, actually you started with, which is um, that the Reagan Udall Foundation is not the only player uh, in the regulatory science game. Um, you know, certainly um, the Institute of Medicine, 
uh, the NIH, the FDA critical path, there's public-private partnerships that don't involve any of those mentioned parties. Um, what role do you see the foundation playing in sort of coordinating all these activities? Um, I mean, I think in industry, you know, we certainly place a lot of our um, expertise resources, our funding resources along all these initiatives. Um, but we sometimes don't see, sometimes we see duplication, sometimes we see lack of shared learning. So what role do you, um, the entire board actually see um, Reagan Udall playing in the facilitation and coordination of these regulatory science initiatives and specifically um, should PDUFA pass in its current iteration, you know, there are a whole host of new regulatory science initiatives that currently live with the FDA. Will the Reagan Udall Foundation play any role in, in actually implementing those initiatives? Yeah, I, well, I think the, I don't want to speculate on the legislation yet. I mean, like that remains to be seen. But uh, as today's discussion has made very clear, there is no shortage of unmet regulatory science needs uh, out there. And I think where the foundation has a special advantage is in, as, as Tachi and others have emphasized, this ability to, to bring different perspectives together. Um, we have a statutory mission with a, a tie to the FDA to get input from the FDA as we're, we've been doing on uh, what uh, the FDA thinks are some of the most important unmet scientific needs uh, underpinning their, uh, their ability to, to carry out their regulatory mission. Um, we've certainly gotten a lot of perspectives from other groups on, on those as well. And this is such a big area that, you know, I certainly hope that the, the activities that are ongoing in the private sector and uh, uh, in FDA's limited, uh, actually very limited uh, uh, research budget uh, uh, are able to continue. Um, but uh, given the magnitude of the unmet needs and given our unique position to um, specifically being directed by Congress to, to bring these different uh, activities together, uh, I don't think there's going to be any shortage of work. And as you said, we've spent uh, a good deal of time and effort uh, to get to this point uh, to identify areas where there is not uh, a mechanism for, for meeting the need, where uh, there is a, a, a potential for uh, very high value added, and there is a, a mechanism for us to, to gather the, the resources needed to support those efforts, uh, um, often by pulling together some of these uh, diverse activities. So um, I don't want to give you a specific, I don't think I can give you a specific substantive, you know, th this, 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 and this are the three things that we'll be doing. Um, we've identified some major areas where there seem to be some very big unmet needs and some real potential for the foundation to fill them. And we're going to keep up, uh, hopefully expand on this process of, uh, uh, of uh, collaboration and, and interaction and feedback to, to make sure that we're doing the best job we can in, in meeting those needs. And if the other board members have uh, additional have, perspectives on this. I have a comment because I happen to sit on three of these public-private <laughs> partnership commissions. And <laughs> all three. All three. All three and, 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 you know, wonder. Uh, but but uh, uh, the question is right. Um, there has to be collaboration. So we have NIH liaison on Reagan Udall. There is um, FDA liaison on FNIH and on PCORI, we do not, uh, where we have uh, NIH and ARC. So we're very aware of what um, others are doing. But it is very important. We have a very specific uh, a niche at Reagan Udall, and that's to support the science mission of the FDA, so we should not do things that, you know, we can partner, we can do things just like FDA is involved um, at the FNIH on the, uh, on many of the projects, particularly the biomarker many, so that's important, but we should do projects that are very specifically oriented to the um, FDA and bring others on, but we can participate with others, but we all are very keenly aware of the resources and what's going on, and we should not recreate the, uh, the wheel. So, so I think the inventory landscape, so to speak, is incredibly important. And, and actually, it's not a formal process, but um, there are a lot of discussions that we've all had now, whether it's the Critical Path Institute or the FNIH or um, new digs at MIT. I mean, there, there's a variety of these groups, and so we've been having discussions one on one, one trying to figure out now what is it you're working on, and what are we working on, what are we about, and um, so we've had a lot of those discussions already, and there is a little bit of chatter about maybe, uh, including Bakori as well, um, 
potentially doing something on some frequency where we Correct. kind of explain to each other what we're working on um, so we can better understand how we could partner and to make sure we're not duplicative. But it's really just a discussion at this point and we're kind of exploring and trying to understand what each other does. But there is a lot of discussion going on right now among the communities. Another comment to, to that point is, is, is really the, the focus on communications. Yeah. Um, at my place, at my institution, uh, when I utter the word coordination, everybody sort of says, no one's, no one's going to coordinate uh, us. Uh, and I think, and, and, and I think that that's probably true for all the things that we do. But the point is that there's so much to do. There's so many challenges that we need to know what each other is doing because it would be a terrible shame to vastly duplicate efforts uh, and to sort of knowingly step on people's toes. That, that, that it seems that would be real shame. And so I think we have an opportunity, um, you know, with everybody's support to be sure that we're interacting. And that's why there's a beauty in a public-private uh, enterprise and that it can be a convening place. So convening doesn't coordinate. Convene means you just bring people to the table so you can talk. Mm -hmm. And that's really sort of the goal here. But the other thing about Raiden Udall is that there, there's talk, but there's also implementation opportunities. Correct. Correct. Not immense amount, at least at this point, <laughs> but a great place to get started. Jane, you emphasize pilots. Mm -hmm. It's a great place to sort of begin. You know, what are, what are the things that we need to do, given the fact that we don't know exactly what is needed at this point. We just really want to know what to do, but we need to learn. And the way to do it is to experiment. Other comments or questions? Uh, anything else from the, from the board? This has been a great discussion. I really want to uh, thank, uh, again, the people who prepared comments, but also those of you who uh, stepped forward with some uh, questions and comments that provoked some very useful discussion. Um, I've gotten a lot out of this, and I'm looking yes. forward to, to, to more input. Um, and as I said, while we will have more public meetings like this one, this is going to be a regular occurrence. In addition, we want to make sure that we're getting input along the way. So uh, once again, uh, comments and uh, uh, suggestions, questions through the, uh, the uh, comments mechanism on the website is a great place to start. Uh, look for that uh, listserv coming up soon with uh, our new announcements to make sure that you'll hear about things that we're doing and uh, can uh, find out about them and, and uh, uh, work with us on them in a, uh, in a timely way. Uh, as, uh, as you heard today, there's, there, there's a lot to do. Uh, you have to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that uh, this foundation has come together with a very broad range of perspectives on uh, handling a, a number of very challenging issues simultaneously from a scientific standpoint, from the uh, con communication and uh, convening and, and coordination standpoint, from the, uh, from the funding standpoint. Uh, none of these are easy issues in themselves. Uh, the fact that uh, we're to this point is a testament uh, uh, to the uh, commitment of the, the board members and, and staff that we have here, but also to the, the breadth of support and interest and, and uh, feedback, constructive feedback, frank feedback that we've gotten from so many of the, the stakeholder organizations and, and potential partners in these activities. It's a great foundation to build on. We've got a lot of work ahead of us, and I uh, uh, can't wait to get going on it. Uh, thank you all so much for the, the contributions today and in advance for uh, the collaboration and, and the input to come. I also want to give a special thanks to West Policy Center and uh, Katie Howard in particular for uh, use of their facilities here today, and we are very much looking forward to staying in touch. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>